Delighted to be volume proof. Can you hear me back there? Oh, okay. How's that? Is that better? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So good evening. And let me first introduce myself. I'm Ramiro Salazar. I'm the director of the San Antonio Public Library. On behalf of the Library Board of Trustees and the library staff, I, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. It's great to see uh, such a robust crowd for a very special program. Uh, tonight you will be hearing the story of a very special guest. Uh, she will be formally introduced shortly. Um, and it's a story that I hope will resonate with all of you. The Holocaust Learn and Remember series was started five years ago uh, with the idea of using the Holocaust as uh, a tragic event to remind us uh, that we should really strive to value our differences uh, to respect each other and value our differences, not only uh, our cultures, our beliefs, our value systems, our religion, our color, uh, that we need to respect each other uh, in order to build a, a better world for all of us. Uh, you'll hear more about the mission of Holocaust and Learn and Remember from our co-founder, uh, Howie Nestel. Actually, Howie and I thought of this idea, but of course, the our staff are the ones that do the hard work and put it together, and so I will acknowledge them shortly. Uh, I would like to thank several folks uh, and individuals and groups that have made this program possible. Again, this is our fifth year. I'm going to start with some of our sponsors, Carmen and Stephen Goldberg. I'm not sure they're here. I didn't see them. Um, also, Rabbi Samuel and Lynn Stahl, Betty and Jack Bexler. Uh, they have been consistent supporters of the Holocaust Learn and Remember series. The San Antonio Public Library Foundation, and of course our partner, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in San Antonio. And Ellen, Ellen Oliverdis, director of the museum, is here and she'll be speaking shortly. Um, I also would like to acknowledge we have a library board of trustees in the audience, uh, Margarita Sanchez representing District 3. Thank you, Margarita, for being here. Uh, to witness the, the programs that the library has to offer to the community. I would also, as I indicated earlier, uh, Howie and I thought of the idea, but the staff, both from the Holocaust Museum, Memorial Museum, and the San Antonio Public Library are the ones that really work hard to put it together along with the San Antonio Public Library Foundation, so I would like to recognize and acknowledge uh, Candelaria Mendoza, Library Services Administrator, Haley Holmes, uh, who is our coordinator for services to adults, our marketing team led by Kate, Caitlin Coward. Uh, all of them have worked uh, for many, many months to offer the various programs, and we are offering programs throughout the library system um, in this month of January. So I invite you to visit our website, sapl.org. Uh, mysapl.org uh, for additional information on various programs that we will, we are offering throughout the library system. Um, and that, at this time, I would like to invite uh, Howie Nestel, as I indicated earlier. Uh, he and I kind of thought of the idea, and he will tell you more about that story. Howie. <coughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual Holocaust Learn and Remember. There's no more powerful tool than education to change, or as we say in Judaism, to repair the world. What started off, as Ramiro said, as a casual breakfast conversation six years ago has turned into a citywide program of free speakers, events, learning opportunities, digital material, storytelling, and keynote speakers like you'll hear tonight. Over the past five years, thousands of San Antonio citizens have heard firsthand accounts of stories related to the Holocaust, as well as other learning opportunities that detailed not only Holocaust survivors like you heard tonight, but also stories of liberators, rescuers, targeted groups, not only Jews, but several other targeted groups. And all of these things are done solely for the purpose of educating our citizens here in San Antonio and for the effort 
of never repeating what happened during World War II. Participating youngsters around town, their parents and grandparents, and I have my eight-year-old daughter here and my dad here as well, over the past five years have been encouraged to not only learn and remember, but also to think and to act. So tonight, I'll invite you to learn, remember, think and act, but also go back in time in history and learn from somebody else's experience. At this time, I want to call up my friend Elena Olivides to come up and talk to you about the San Antonio Memorial uh, Museum, Holocaust Memorial Museum, of which she's the director, and then also to introduce our speaker tonight. Ellen. Good evening and welcome. My name is Ellen Oyevides, and I serve as the director of the Holocaust Memorial Museum, a subsidiary of the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. The mission of our museum is to educate the public to the dangers of hatred, prejudice, and apathy, all factors that in the Holocaust led to mass murder. By teaching the Holocaust, it allows us to examine basic moral issues, human behavior, and what it means to be a responsible citizen. This month houses the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is observed on January 27th. It is an international memorial day for the victims of the Holocaust. Holocaust is the genocide that resulted in the annihilation of six million European Jews, as well as millions of others by the Nazi regime. The day was designated by the United Nations General Assembly on November 1st, 2005. January 27th is significant, as this is the date in 1945 when the largest Nazi death camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau, was liberated by Soviet troops. The resolution establishing January 27th as International Holocaust Remembrance Day urges every member nation of the UN to honor the memory of Holocaust victims and encourages the development of educational programs about Holocaust history to help prevent future acts of genocide. It rejects any denial of the Holocaust as an event and condemns all manifestations of religious intolerance, incitement, harassment, or violence against persons or communities based on ethnic origin or religious belief. 72 years from the liberation of Auschwitz, it is more important than ever to remind ourselves of the universal lessons of the Holocaust and to foster a shared culture of remembrance. We partner in gratitude with the San Antonio Public Library for this program, this program, Learn and Remember. This program furthers the mission of the museum to educate the community in a great effort to never forget and to the great desire for never again. At this time, I would like to introduce Hannah Pankowski. Hannah is a Holocaust survivor and an author. Her extraordinary experience is about finding refuge in the Americas. Please welcome Hannah Pankowski. You know, I look slightly different, <laughs> this, but it's okay. All I need is this, my break. <laughs> but I have can see young audience here too, and I want to remind them that this was the age when the war started. So. Well, my childhood was a very happy one, and I never dreamed it's going to happen, what happened to us. And I remember when my childhood really ended, and I was in a day camp, and we gathered, the teacher gathered us and said, be ready, we have to leave the camp right now. When I board the bus, 
to go back home. I left behind my childhood. Because, you know, in the war, there are no time for the children. The children grow up very fast. I wish I had more time to narrate everything. I don't have that much time. So I'm going to point this main events and how we finally adapt to new life. Well, from the very beginning, we knew the Nazi soldiers approaching our city. My father and my brother left the city in order to hope to find the fighting unit and start fighting. My mother and I stayed behind. And I remember when the first group entered the city and I could hear them marching on the street. And we the Jews, especially, we were forced to go on the street. We were given the flowers and they told us to throw the flowers on the soldiers. And this was done for propaganda reason. They took the film and they say, you see, the Jews welcome us here. Of course, it was not so, because we throw the flowers with the soldiers with the bayonets on our back. So if we didn't throw the flowers here right in the spot. And the bad things start coming very fast. So I'm going to go to the highlight of what happened. Very first, um, the curfew was imposed and we couldn't go on the street after the dark. Then, as it was not enough, the rations of food was very limited, and we would start getting hungry, starving. And as if this was not enough, they forced the Jews wear the yellow stars. And why the yellow star? Well, to be easily identified when you walk on the street and to humiliate and to do whatever they want, arrest us or even to kill us. And I thought, I don't want to wear a yellow star, I take it out. But you couldn't do this because if you were on the street, they were patrolling and asking of ID, identification. And in the paper was stamped that you are a Jude, you Jew. And you were a Jew and didn't wear the yellow star, you'll be killed on the spot. So I have no other choice in the, to wear the yellow star. But you know what? I understood, and I was proud to wear my yellow star. I was proud who I was in my heritage. I wear the yellow star and proud. In the beginning, <clears throat> we could go to school. Later on, we were not allowed to go to school. But in the beginning of the war, we allow to go to school. And for a little while it was okay, it looked like it be normal life, but it wasn't. And I remember one day at school, we were sitting in the class and we smelled smoke. And we look in the window and cross Across the street from my school was a beautiful synagogue. And we saw the synagogue 
learning. And we saw the people with the yellow stars, the Jews, who was standing and throwing the gasoline on the synagogue. Behind them were soldiers, machine guns. And if you didn't throw this, the gasoline, they would kill you. And it was a spiral. And again, with propaganda reason. And they say, you see, we don't do anything. The Jews are burning the own synagogue. Meantime, we, the petrified children, sit at school. And we could hear the scream of the people who were trapped inside the burning synagogue. And we thought, well, this was going to happen to us. Our teacher tried to calm us. And I'm sure she was just as scared as we were. Well, we survived this time. But for many of my children, was not for too, my friends, it was not for too long. Next thing what happened is they forbid the Jews to walk on Main Street. And this means if you friend live across the street, you have to walk all around the city to go to see them. At that time, they evicted our school from our building. And they allocated us. In the school, they happened to be across the street when I live. What did it mean to me? <coughs> that in order to go to school, I have to run all over the city to reach the school. And then come home, run again. So, one day, I was a child, you see in the picture, I said to my little girlfriend, I don't understand, all my life I walk on the street, why I cannot walk to today on the street? And I said, I'm going to cross the street. Well, I stopped crawling the street. And my little friend starts screaming, Hannah, Hannah, come back, Germans. And then I noticed that two SS soldiers took their machine guns and started shooting. I couldn't go back because I was already on the street. And I ran as fast as I could, I managed to cross the street. How I ma managed to survive, I don't know. Probably it was my destiny so I could be today and talk to you. Well, I was lucky, but I have a little friend who tried to do the same thing, and he wasn't that lucky. The bullet hit him, and he fell on the street, and they SS soldiers wouldn't allow to pick up his body. He lay on the street and they said, you see, this is what happened to you if you don't obey our orders. Things are getting bad. At that time, they start talking that they're going to form a ghetto. And ghetto is when all the Jews were part of, part of the city, and we have to go and leave this enclosure. My mother decided that she was going to escape. Now I have to stop for a minute and say about my mother. 
My mother was um, very accomplished, talented painter. Her own work were lost during the war. And when I think today, she lived a shelter life, but when I think today, how a heroic action she undertook and tried to escape to Germans. And I have to explain here. At that time, there was packed with Russian of not intervention. And Poland was divided in half. West Poland become German and East Poland become a Russian. So, we, as I mentioned before, the, my father and brother left the city. We didn't hear from them. We didn't know if they are alive or not. But at that point, my mother said, I escaped. And it was so risky. And then she was told, you have just 1% chance of survival. And she said, well, if I'll die, I'll die with her. But if I survive, we both survive. How he managed arrange the escape, I wish I asked her, but I never did. All I know that she told us, she told me we're going to leave. Run to your grandma and say goodbye to her. And I remember I run to my grandma and I say, we're leaving, but don't worry, grandma, we'll be pretty soon back. And my grandmother hugged me, kissed me, and said, no, I never see you again. And she didn't. She died in concentration camp. Well, I returned to home and we then uh, she, she arranged the bus and the driver and how she obtained it false identification for us. So we pretend that we are not you. And this, as it is, was punished by that. And the driver accepts to take us out of the city and drive us to the part of Poland occupied by Russia. When we left the city, at some point, they stopped us and searched the bus. And they asked us out of the no, bus truck, asked us to step out and start searching. We have some weapons, I don't know what. We're searching a little girl, but but I knew I was scared. I was petrified because they took my mother one room and they took me to another room. But I knew that I cannot look scared because if I do and I betray, they're going to suspect that I am not the person I am that I am a Jewish. And this, what I said before, the children grow up fast. I understood. I have to smile, be polite. The woman searched me, and she let me go. I just can think what happened, what was going on my mother's mind when I was separated from her. But we were lucky again. We managed to escape. The driver took us to the frontier and the border was river that divides Poland, West Poland from East Poland. And he took us to the river, which was a 
deep forest. And by that time, <clears throat> was already winter and snow and cold. He drove us all in the forest, turned around and left us alone there. But Germans knew that some Jews wanted to escape. So they had the dog, the searching light, to see if anybody tried to escape. If you catch them, you, they kill you on the spot. And all of a sudden, we heard the dog barking and the searching lights going on. And all my mother could do was throw me on the snow and recover herself of the snow. We were afraid to breathe, lay still down there, and somehow the dog lost sense of us and we held them going away, and the searching light disappeared. Once again, we survived. We managed to cross the river, but the, and we entered Russian, um, Russian uh, part of Poland, that they occupied. Well, we managed to escape, but life in Russia was not picnic even. And then they didn't like us too much even. Luckily, my mother knew some friends in the nearby city, the other stock, that lived there, and she said, let's go and see if we can find them. And we found them. We knock at the door. And the woman opened the door, saw my mother, and couldn't believe it that we were there. And then she said, do I have a surprise for you? I guess what? She went back in the house. I came back with my brother, and I don't have to say you how happy we were that he was alive too. Well, we learned that my father was alive too. But they sent him to work in Russia. We they allow us to join him. And we went to Russia in this uh, first adaptation, I would say, to Russian life began. I have to say that when we left the house, my house and my city, we left everything behind. We just walk out with nothing on. And I was asked how important it is for the, the, the children here, even new clothes, where they go to school, and the matching colors. It doesn't close them, matter. We left everything that we escaped with life. And this was what's important. Well, as I say, the life in the Russia was not easy. And I go, go, I'm going to go very briefly what happened in Russia. Okay, of course, I, went, I was sent back to school. And I had to learn Russian. And I had undergrown the humiliation from other children and from the teacher, because this was communist child Russia, and I went to capitalist country. 
As I mentioned, my mother was an artist. So once we settled, uh, it was already spring, she decided to go outside to do some skits. So she took paper and pencil, go outside and start drawing. But it just so happened in the back of the house, there was a railroad going by. And before she knew, two uh, uh, in service, uh, service, uh, circuit service, sorry, uh, were on her side, and they grabbed her and arrest her and accuse her of being spied. Meantime, we didn't know what happened to her. She didn't return home. And it was evening and it was getting late. And she was still not at home. To our relief, later, very late at night, we saw her coming to our apartment. How she was safe. They told her that she is not going to see the light of the day anymore. And there were various interrogators. And she looked at one of them and he asked, why are you staring at me like this? And she said, because you have an inter interested face. I want to pe paint you one time. If he goes to Boston, he lets her go. <laughs> <laughs> then, <clears throat> uh, then my father went to Russia as a worker, worker but of course he, he was not. He was a businessman and a scholar and well-to-do man, but he was no, no, in Russian. And he belonged also to political organization that was prohibited. And someone in the village or settlement that we live recognized my father. He denounced him to speak with service. And we was doomed to die in, in Siberia. But what happened? In 1941, in June, the German, uh, Germany broke pact of no aggression. And as you know, they invited Russia. We live in very close to the border. German army advised advanced very quick, and before we knew, they were all scared, scared of us, where we live. We have to run again, and I mean, we run for our life, because staying behind with the Germans will be certain that this way we have a chance to survive. I am not going to go the details how terrifying and how difficult was the escape to go inside in Russia. But again, we managed. I survived there. Well, as we said, we were sent to have to get quick. <laughs> Uh, the Russia was very difficult. They sent us to part of Russia in the forest, bitter cold, 50 below zero. We didn't have a proper clothes, and we were starving. But this, for you, for the youngest one, no matter what, we sent us, I went to school. I have to walk in the snow, about about three kilometers to school, and they run back. 
Education was very important for my parents, no matter what. The survival in Russia was very, it was a miracle that we survived. But I have to go ahead and we, war ended. And we were, okay, we survived. We're going, then the Polish government in exile have a pact with Russia and they allow the Russian refugee come back to Poland, to her home. And we did start reading deep. We're going home, we're going home. But going home was not what we imagined. The very first thing we saw was a stone from the graveyard, paved, paved the street. The street was paved with them, and we tried not to walk up them. We saw the homes, but the homes were empty. No one that we knew survived. All my little friends, except the two, three little girls survived. All my teacher, all my friends, my cousin, my uncle, and everybody was gone. And we saw in the silent city, devastating. Uh, well, we, we were lucky we survived one cousin that survived. But we realized what's ha happening in Poland, and the Poland become communist satellite. And we knew we cannot stay in Poland. We have to run. And we have <coughs> run <coughs> we have to run again and escape. We tried to escape to uh, Czechoslovakia, Austria, and Germany. And today, when I look at these refugees from Syria and uh, Somalia, and, and I can see myself, this is how we were escaping trying to save our lives. And the, when I talk it, give a presentation with the hope that this never repeat itself, the horror. But unfortunately, they still happening today. And but even more more we have to be aware what it is in so prevent these things. Well, we had escaped and we were sent to Germany to displace person camp. Displaced person was the person who has no home, no country, no place to go. And leaving displaced person camp was no picnic. There was no work nothing to do, and we're just wondering our hope to start a new life was what's going to happen to now. Because at that <clears throat> time, we tried to go to some country, the United States, or we have, um, I have an uncle in the States who tried to desperately to bring us there. He wouldn't let us in. All the doors to Jews were closed. No country in the world will accept us. And we sit there and thought, now what are we going to do? We have no house, no home, no place to go. <coughs> well, my uncle was lucky. He managed to get us a visa to Cuba, but we are, when we are ready to go, the Cuban government said, uh-uh, no, we don't devolve the visa. So he get us, managed to get us visa to Mexico, and we were lucky enough to immigrate to Mexico. But here come 
the adaptation to new country, no language, nowhere to go, and nobody, we didn't know nobody gone. But when we what was worse when we arrived in Mexico, the custom service look at our patient papers and say, You can enter Mexico. Your visa expired yesterday. And by that time my mother fainted. And my father argued, We have no place to go. We can't go back to Poland. The doors are closed. What do you want us to do? We can enter the Mexico. And my father was perpetual optimist. He got get hold of the, a telephone diction, um, directory and start looking for the names. And he, well, there was a Jewish name on it that he thought they were Jewish. Start talking, died the number of talking Yiddish. Of course, we didn't speak Spanish. And many people hung up on him, others laughed at him. But he finally found somebody who answered him in Yiddish. And they say, don't worry, we We'll, we'll do something about it. And sure enough, they come and we were able to get into the city. Well, about myself, my adaptation was very difficult. I went, couldn't speak Spanish. I was informed that the girl my age I was about 17 and 18. It's an old maid. Because the girls at that time, I'm glad they changed it now, but at that time, 65 years ago, the girls were getting married early. And they say, at 18, then you should have already the children. <laughs> and besides, you refugee, you have no money. And with mom, no money, nobody is going to marry you. And here I stood thinking, what I'm going to do? I could go to work because uh, my, we have temporary permit, permit to stay in Mexico. And my father risked his life, but he found some little jobs so we could survive. But what am I going to do? I can't go on the street after dark because young girls don't go on the street after the dark at that time. I can work. I can get married. And what am I going to do? And it was a very difficult period of time. But then I found out the school in Mexico is all, don't cost almost nothing. So I enrolled at school. And uh, started going to Polytechnic. And learned, learned, uh, to be physical chemistry or bacteriology. And I, over there, I met my classmate. What happened that he had a cousin? And he said, introduce me to his cousin. And as I said, every rule has exception. And I met this young man. And 65 years ago, we're sitting here, 65 years, the four, children, four grandchildren, we're living here. So, but then when my husband finished training, school, we went for residency in 
citizenship to the United States. And they let him go, but I couldn't go. Because why? Because I was in Russia, and I was educated in Russia. I was communist in that time. You younger people don't remember this, but we, they would not let me go in the United States. It took a long time, a lot of effort, that finally I came to the United States. But that time, that time we, learned, we were expecting our first baby. Ah, uh, now the other adaptation came to life in the United States. I found myself all alone in the city of Baltimore. My husband had to go back to work. He installed me in a little hotel downtown and go back to, to work. And here I was, no language, no money. I had five dollars in the pocket. And I spent the night there in this hotel. The next morning I was starving and I wanted to go something to eat. And I realized that I couldn't afford the restaurant in the hotel. And I was scared to death to go on the street. But I did. And I walk in straight line, and I found something that looked like there was a, people were eating. I walk in, and I didn't know what to do. I just stood there, and my tears in my eyes were starving. So one young man approached me, and he started speaking to me, and said, only thing I can say in English, thank you. And he showed me what, what should I do, and it simply was a cafeteria. So I ordered my scrambled egg, I still remember. Toast and coffee, and I was happy. So the life in the United States was difficult, but we overcome it. We finally ended in San Antonio. And, but that, uh, when we established ourselves, my children grew up and we brought up our parents here. And talking about the adaptation, if you want to do something and you work hard enough, you do achieve what you want. I learned Spanish because I failed to mention that when I failed, found this young man, he didn't speak Polish, I didn't speak Spanish. And he said, oh, you learned Spanish. I learned Spanish. Uh, uh, my father, my mother began to paint again. My father decided he wants to do something too. And he started collecting Jewish books. And today in San Antonio, UTSA is one of the largest collection of Jewish books, 6,000 volumes. But not only that, he at the age of 84 learned English and learned computer, <laughs> and catalog his book on the computer. My mother became paid again, and today uh, the Shah from the Holocaust Foundation gets hold on her painting, and they had all her collections are now in L.A and they are for part of the traveling exhibit where they go and exhibit them all over the United States in Europe. So, as I said, if I learn English 
And then I, give, I was giving classes, of, of talks at schools and organizations, because I felt how important it is. But I knew that I cannot do this for too much longer. So I took a creative writer course and wrote the book. The book was published at Texas Tech University. So I have said, with difficulties, lots of crying, hard time, you can do whatever you want. And we, the survivors, defeated Hitler. He couldn't exterminate us all. He didn't broke our spirit. We formed new families. We sent our children to school and our children and grandchildren, our educators, productive citizens, their teachers, lawyers, engineers, doctors, nurses. So we show that you can do it if you really make yourself do it. I know sometimes it's very hard, and I'm so glad I see so many young people here. And my message to them is stay in school. Education is more important. And open your mind and fight prejudice, discrimination, and ignorance. And I think my time. About ten minutes for questions. Uh -oh. Do you have any questions? Uh, uh oh, I over. No, I'm fine. <laughs> but someone with a mic, okay? Are there any questions? Uh, you can raise your hand. Okay, oh, the gentleman here. Do you have any fears about what you see in the United States today with President Trump? compared to where you grew up Do I in have Poland. to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> I think I do. I, I, I did want to say thank you. My Aunt Helena, who passed away last July, she went through something very similar. Uh, she, she made it through World War II, survived the labor camps, and thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to thank you for doing this presentation because I think it's very important and we're at eminent points in our lives where we're being affected by everything that's uh, happening right now, as the gentleman mentioned. Uh, the thing with Trump, um, do you plan on continuing to do these seminars? Because I think it's important for our youth today, and as an educator myself, to allow our students to learn and know that this truly did happen because many question them and they'll say, uh, well, my parents said this never happened. It's a lie. And I would love to see that you continue your work. Thank you. I intend as long as I am in capacity to do it and will because it is essential for these things, to prevent these things to happen. Uh, Father Schellenberg from uh, Brook Army Medical Center. And once again, thank you very much for your testimony. What about the element of faith within your own life and in the struggles? And if that assisted you in going through the crossroads and the journeys that you had. Can you comment on that? I don't know that the faith 
um, help this in you just think that you have to do it, you have to survive. And I guess that the fact that you will survive. And um, uh, it's a difficult question to answer. And I don't think I can go in too much detail because, but um, if you lo lose your hope, I wouldn't say faith. If you lose your hope that for the future, then you lose the you lose the faith too, and you don't survive. Well, you are definitely a legacy of hope and faith. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, I had a question about how you traveled from Europe to Mexico, how it is that you came to be there. <laughs> Thank you. If I was start to go in details how it had happened, it would have take me whole night, I think. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it was just right after the war and transportation was very, very difficult. The Jewish organization in Germany, uh, joint organization we call, uh, helped very few of us that could uh, get out of Europe, provide the transportation. But in order to get to Mexico, we have to go to France, to Portugal, to Brazil, to Trinity, to Panama, Trinity, and the time when this was the time we arrived on Mexico, we were too late, our visa expired. When they tried to, the ship was impossible to get. They were so full that we couldn't get any tickets. So, so they uh, arranged for us to fly. But we fly from one little town to another little, and took a long, long time. And exhausting. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yes. Well, I was just a little bit older than you are. <laughs> How old are what's 10? I am your, do I look? I look 10? <laughs> you have a question over here? I'm glad you asked. Thank you. What well, was your favorite subject in school? Oh, I do, I like the math very much, but you have to remember that I went after the war started. There were not schools like you have now. I had to go to a Russian school. I didn't know the language. I have to learn, and I have to adapt to the living room over there. But I like, I think I like the math the most. We have a question right over here. Thank you very much for coming over here. Um, I can tell that just listening to you and the way you express your experiences, that you are a very talented writer. Mm -hmm. I would imagine your mother's painting is just as how you write. My question is on the other end of the spectrum. What would you say to someone who is in denial, it is not in denial of the reality of the Holocaust and all of its, all the evil surrounding it? 
like I guess you could say, like I'm a person currently studying psychology, and although the topic of guilt is not discussed, I guess you could say it's very easy to suppress guilt instead of taking responsibility for it. Does that make Sorry, I'm nervous. Does that make sense? Yes, but... So those who deny exist, existence of Holocaust, how you can deny what you have so much evidence of this? If one person will lie, two persons will lie, but you have hundreds of survivors to testimony the same thing, how you can deny when we have soldiers who liberate the concentration camp, witness what was going on there, how can you deny the truth? It's like they say, the sun doesn't exist because it's dark today. Thank you for coming tonight. We had a question um, studying for tonight for school. We did lots of research on refugees in the aftermath of World War II, and it was really sad reading articles about people who, after the war, went home and there was no home, or their homes were occupied, or communities were gone. And it was an angle we've never thought of. And so having to leave your home, did you guys attempt to go back, or? Was there anything to go back to, or how we just can understand going through that? So you surviving it, like, how do you feel about that? And did you attempt to go home, or what was there? Well, when we left the Russia, we wanted to go home, but the home wasn't there anymore. It was destroyed. The people wasn't there. They would perish. There was nothing. In Poland, there was no home anymore. And then, personally, when I go from country to country, and like in Israel, the door for us was closed because the Israel was, was an English mandate, and they would not allow the Jews to go in. Where is my home? Wherever my family lives, when they were, I had my house and my warm place and my chair and family surrounding me, this is my home. We have a couple more questions right here. Oh, thank you for coming and sharing your story with us. I would like to know what happened to your brother. My brother? Well, my brother survived too, and he emigrated with us to, to Mexico. He was married there. He um, has a, a, a daughter and the grandson. Unfortunately, uh, I lost him in a car accident in Mexico. He was fighting in the, in the very first line of battles against the Ger Germany, but he survived the Hi, I just want to thank you for being here and let you know that I have a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for you. Um, I'd like to know um, how exactly you felt at the moment that you knew that the war was over. Um, because for us, 9-11 is a day that we all remember and sticks with us and we know exactly what we were doing at that moment. So for you, that would have been that knowing the war was over, do you remember exactly how you found out and exactly the way that you felt? I do. I do remember. But I, 
most remember the day when the war started because this was the end of my childhood, uh, or the end of my home, or the end of my family that didn't survive. But uh, yes, I do remember, and we had great expectation that, the, as I mentioned, that the war ended and we're going to go home. Unfortunately, there was no home to go to. But you have to keep going, and as I said, we form our families and we form our homes. How long did you uh, live in Mexico City? In Mexico City, uh, actually living there just four years. But we have our family living in Mexico, yeah, so we're constantly going to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's family, because I know something. Yeah, I'm from Mexico City. Yeah. And you went to uh, Mexico? My, my, my daughter went. Yeah, I was in the Ishe in Mexico. And the other one was in the Yapni. Ishe Shule. Ishe Shule in Mexico. Yeah. Ihr redet da sind Niedisch. Hm? Ihr redet da sind Niedisch. I I don't speak Niedisch. Okay. No, Niedisch, Niedisch. Niedisch, yeah. Yes. Ihr redet Niedisch. No. Do you read Niedisch? No. no. <laughs> Remember, I was growing up in Russia. I see. And this was forbidden language. So, yeah. I want to congratulate you. So I we were forbidden to even speak my language, Polish, at home. Yeah. We have forced to speak uh, Russian. And the living in Russia was constant fear. And we uh, wouldn't dare. So this is. One more question? Well, two more. Uh, Hannah, uh, did your mother's art uh, confront y'all's journey and what y'all experienced? Um, did her paintings depict some of the things that y'all had experienced or some of the tribulations y'all had uh, encountered? Yeah, my daughter will explain this better than I do. Hi, I'm Helen Pankowski, and uh, I'm one of the I'm the one that that she talks about when she talks about her kids. Um, <laughs> so I'll I'll make this brief, but um, it's really very exciting for us as a family because uh, my grandmother's art um, in Russia she was too depressed to paint. And she really didn't paint again until she went to Mexico. And she was very depressed there too, but a painting was commissioned and because they didn't have a lot of money, she, um, my grandfather pretty much said, you know, need to, need to do this. And uh, fortunately for us, the people who commissioned the painting did not uh, want it in the end. But it got her started painting again. Now remember, nothing survived from her time in, uh, during the war. Um, so in Mexico, uh, although she wasn't in a concentration camp and although uh, they were not religious uh, during, as, you know, in her family and while she was growing up in, in my mother's family, that is the, the basic themes that she began to paint. Uh, so there are Holocaust imagery, there is, she uh, really liked painting um, 17th and 18th century wooden synagogues, a lot of images of the stereotypical, the pre-war, the shtetl, the, the Jewish life, just everyday life. And then later on, she painted um, images of Mexico, so it's a whole different a group of paintings, and through and really painted up until the end of her life, uh, Mexico things from San Antonio, um, stories uh, from um, you know biblical stories. 
So these, a lot of these paintings for years were in my closet because, you know, the burning synagogue and the concentration camp. And recently, about two years ago, we started worrying, like, what's going to happen to these paintings? And, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we got worried that they're going to end up at, uh, you know, behind the dump somewhere. So we were very fortunate to uh, a, a lovely coincidences and, and events that were, you know, my mother mentioned destiny. Um, the Goldrich Foundation, the representative from the Goldrich Foundation came to San Antonio, saw the paintings, fell in love with them, and we donated everything to them. And that was what was my, my mother was referring to, that they are in the hands of the Goldrich Foundation, who um, uh, they, their family founded the Holocaust Museum in uh, L.A., and they're very involved in uh, educating for the Holocaust. And so the future of the paintings is that they have now been um, put into a collection and they are going to be exhibited throughout the United States and, and, and the world. So does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. And they're going to use them as education history and, and painting. So they have my book and writing and my mother painting. So this will be your, the last question. Hola, Mrs. Pankowski. Yes, you pronounce I'm so well. glad you learn Spanish. <laughs> Yo también hablo. También hablamos español. Ay, oh, qué bonito se escucha. <laughs> it sounds really good. Um, what is your message um, as another immigrant? I'm an immigrant myself. Uh, what is your message for all of us as immigrants to this country who came here to find a good life and a good opportunity? What is your message for all those that are like, who fears for you know, the new government and all of this? What is your message of hope for those who think that they're going to be deported or, or not? Well, this is a very difficult question to ask. I cannot predict. I wish of all my heart that it don't, you stay here. But the message is have a hope. And I don't know, you're working or studying. This is so important that I think let yourself know that you are here and you're productive citizen and you access toward the country, not the burden. You work, you pay taxes, and you should be welcome here. And Thank you so much. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Hope and in the darkest minute in my life, we we'll always have a hope. Somehow we'll survive. It's going to be okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So be before I close the program, I want to uh, acknowledge Nowcast, who is streaming live uh, this session. Uh, the executive director, Charlotte M. Lucas, who's back here. Um, you will, the, this session will be archived and can be accessed later. Um, tell your friends that it's available, and this program will also be promoted uh, via social media through Nowcast as well as through the San Antonio Public Library. Again, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Hannah, for sharing your story with us. We greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.